Hello and welcome to this second podcast episode. Um, my name is Annika Lucas. I uh, would like to ask you to begin um, to um, consider supporting this podcast. Um, I would like to go out and interview people in person with uh, professionals recording this. And obviously none of this is free. And um, I'll have a donate button on the screen. You can uh, go right there or you can go to my website, AnnikaLucas.com if you uh, feel like you would like to support this content so that I also will be able to continue to put out the materials completely free, of course. So the second podcast, I'm very happy to introduce to you a friend of mine who is also a survivor of SRA, Rachel Vaughn. And Rachel and I are going to be speaking about subjects, um, and of course, connected to the abuse and connected to uh, certain things that these abusers have done that are definitely disturbing. Uh, it is the nature of this abuse, of course, and and it is graphic. So we're going to be talking quite a bit about a man who was uh, her main abuser and the only uh, known name that I can think of to compare this man with would be Jeffrey Dahmer, the serial killer. If you're not aware, you can look him up. But um, in some ways, I believe that this man is worse because as far as I know, Jeffrey Dahmer didn't really target children. And as Rachel has um, made many efforts to um, make the authorities aware of uh, this man's activities and submitted many, many complaints, reports, she obviously is going to go into some detail. So just be warned. Um, even in this conversation, I am going a little bit into the psychology of this serial killer. And when we do that, I just wanted to be very clear that this is not to excuse any of this person's actions. It seems that it's often difficult to tell the difference between judgment and discernment. And someone brought that up in a comment, so thank you for that. Um, Judgment is a projection, a negative projection that comes from within yourself that is actually connected to something that you have not really fully seen within yourself. That is ultimately what it relates to. When you go to your own shadow side, when you uncover your own shame and look at your own impulses, um, survival impulses often, then you find that you have the same impulses. Children in the network are often trained to become exactly like the perpetrators. That is to say that those natural impulses that are related to trauma responses are manipulated and then poured into one channel only, which is that most destructive way. So as a child going through that, you experience the same things as do the adults. The adults have just never made the choice to end it, whereas uh, the survivors that are speaking out, the survivors that are healing, uh, have probably never wanted to be there in the first place and always had a, a shred of that sense left that there was something wrong with that. So... The healing process is to go behind those impulses and those and all the feelings going so deep into trauma that you then have walked that path for yourself and can really understand it because you've lived it and then you felt everything. And that is what brings understanding. And so when I speak about these issues, it's because I want to bring that understanding, not to forgive or to excuse the perpetrators, but so that we can all 
see these things better when they're occurring, that we can look at a person and see more clearly what they are about, what they are hiding, and learn to tell the cues. People often give themselves away in many ways, and they will say things and do things that would be suspicious if you're more aware, especially if you're fully aware of your own dark side and have broken through every little shame that was imposed on you and that you have looked at and healed and come to 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 felt the grief and all the pain behind it when you do that work you can see clearly and that is i think what we need to do in order to bridge that gap to to stop the division uh, too often when we're talking about people of this caliber of evil very easily people end up wishing and wanting desiring the same thing to do to this person the same thing that they are judging them for and then we're back in the cycle so that is what i'm i'm trying to bring awareness to so that we can end the cycle and that we can in fact create real change not just a change of um th those that are in power not a coup uh, but a real change a real change from within each person so without further ado i will now start the interview with rachel vaughn rachel so thank good to you see you <laughs> So, so wonderful to be on this podcast and how brilliant to actually sort of put yourself out there and do this. I think the more and more people that can speak as well as you can who can do that, the better. Oh, thank you. It just made sense. And uh, it's also, I also feel it's my time now to introduce others like yourself, you know, who you have been public for quite a number of years, haven't you? Yes, I have since 2018, but I, I was on, I was very loud on social media before that. Yeah. And I just got tired of being ignored by uh, authorities, and so I got louder. Yeah, that's right. You have this history with authorities and trying to um, make claims, and uh, we're going to get into that a lot. I want to really, um, because particularly about, well, everything, but yes, you have filed many, many reports, and <laughs> and it's very interesting what has happened with that. I think that is a absolutely a story in itself. I would like, um, you know, a lot of people don't know you yet, and I, I, I would love to ask you. Um, I know that this is difficult to talk about, and thank you for, for being willing. I know that you've told your story several times, so thank you for telling it again. Um, I would love to hear a little bit. Uh, I know you're from Australia. Um, I have heard some parts of your story. I know that lots of it is also available um, on videos and so forth, and your channels are going to be shared. But could you uh, tell, give, tell us um, basically what happened to you and just a warning for people that um, your story is very extreme. So just want to be very clear about that before you even begin to share. Thank you. So trigger warning for anybody who's who's been through this sort of thing, and for those who haven't even been through this sort of thing, it's uh, it's, a, it's it's intense. So I grew up in South Australia, which is um, right down the bottom of Australia um, in the Great Australian Bight. Um, my father was a telecom or a telecommunications officer by day, um, but his actual job and he was quite open about it was that he would phone tap people, so he would listen into people's conversations. Um, but so that story, also, is that sort of for the for the Australian version of the FBI or the the CIA? Yeah. So so just as a telecommunications officer, he he was a line tapper, but that's obviously something you know much more intense. So I've always described him as an ASIO operative, which is the CI the Australian okay. version of the CIA or MI six. Um, and my brother and sister have, have referred to him in the same terms. So I have two siblings who were also abused by him. Um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, so I was born in 1973. My two siblings who were also abused and have made 
um, official allegations against my father were born in the 50s. So um, our abuse, or I should describe specifically my abuse, it was sexual. Um, it was violently sexual. He, he, there were certain techniques that were used, and I'll go into that in a, in a little while because it's quite, quite grotesque, but um, we weren't just sexually abused by my father. He handed me over to his friends for abuse, and that happened to my brother as well. Um, and my, my brother, Andrew McIntyre, had Anthony Munro incarcerated, and that took us 10 years of, of lobbying. Um, and Anthony Munro is the co-accused with my father, Alan Maxwell McIntyre, for the disappearance of the three Beaumont children. Yes, yes, and I know, I, and I've been reading up a little bit. Thank you. Um, so there's the Beaumont children, and we definitely want to talk about that. And Anthony Munro was, you know, the main suspect, was, uh, I mean, proof all over the place. But yes, uh, that's the case that I really want to get into. And, um, you know, I'm sorry to bring it back, but just to keep things very simple, um, you were, I heard you, you know, you're you, basically, do you know, how old you were when you the abuse started by your father and his friends? So the first ritual that I experienced, I was just able to stand. Oh my goodness! So you were a toddler, and the ritual what you're describing was that that was not just a sexual abuse. Then now we're speaking immediately about extreme abuse, and that was in a ritualistic way with other people present there. Yes. So that that particular event was me standing watching my father as he officiated over two men dismembering two male bodies. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so, so immediately it's extreme, extreme, as extreme as it can get. Yeah. Okay, and you're a toddler, barely able to stand, and you're yeah. there watching that. Yes. Oh, goodness. So I hadn't called it that a ritual previous to speaking to a, an expert on those things who said he would describe it that way. Um, then there was the sexual abuse with... Do you know why you were there? I mean, I know you were very young, but... I would say specifically to traumatise me. Yeah. To um, indoctrinate you into that into that kind of like fear-based... Um... Yes, I believe so. I, I had been taken to that location previously, um, and again, I was taken there later. So that location, do you know what that, do you know where that is? Yes. Okay. So I told police. Okay, okay. You've told police also, yeah. okay. Um, and okay. it's interesting, I was told after my um, um, first interview came out in 2018, I was told by locals in the area, because this, this location was close by to where I grew up in Edwardstown, um, it was a, a neighbouring suburb, and locals told me that there had been a raid on this particular place, many, many detectives, um, between, within three weeks of my first interview coming out, and that was an international interview. So there was definitely interest in what I had said, uh, but nothing else that I know of happened after that. But of course, I, I'm not I'm not in the loop. Police don't like me very much. <laughs> also, it's um, it's a raid, but it's many years after the fact, and it's many. and many years after you had also filed the police report and and, and another report. So, yes. yes. Yes, exactly. Okay, so, so that, that's that the, the first, first thing that you remember, which is like extreme, extreme, extreme. So we're immediately into murders, graphic, graphic. Okay, so, okay, so very sorry. That's okay. okay. Yeah, and your father was officiating, so he had a role in this group that yes. was a lead. Okay, he was a leader? Yes, he was, yes. So uh, from what I can um, understand, he, he was in the Naval Reserves, though I cannot get his Navy um, ID, ID number or any information on which um, operations he went out on or, or, or what he was involved in. The, the National Archi Archives have no evidence of that. I've got photographs of him in his Navy uniform. Oh. But they, they can't provide that information to me, which is very frustrating because there's one particular disappearance of um, children in South Australia, where he has told one of my siblings who doesn't believe that he was an abuser, that he was away on a Navy um, excursion at that time. Okay, so basically he was in the Navy. This sibling remembers that he was away on a Navy ex excursion. And for whatever reason, you can't find proof of it. 
And whether that is because the Navy doesn't want to give it to you or because the because it wasn't because he was never truly in the Navy. That's the other thing. He could he could have just been lying about that and had the uniform. He had a lot of what you would describe as disguises. He had a wig. He had a blonde wig and that he would don at certain times. Um, he would shave or, or grow a beard or he, he was constantly changing his appearance. Um, and, and he had he would change the way that he would stoop or stand. You know, he, he oh. was quite clever. He was quite clever. Um, so it's he interesting. He was a telecommunications man with an extra job, but he also ran this cult, or would you call it a cult? Yes, definitely. Yes. And, and it was this, this cult, uh, this local cult would say, right, it was a local cult? Yes, it was. And was it connected to other, other instances that you know, I mean, from your own experiences? Certainly connected with one that's in Geelong, in Victoria, which is a neighbouring state. And, so, and, you, and you were also taken there? I wasn't taken there that I remember, okay. but he travelled backwards and forwards constantly. Okay. Um, yeah, so, and he ended up living there as well, and there's a very powerful cell that's well known. Oh, they have a okay. Tavistock cell, cell, actually, in, in that state, in that area, so I believe that's why he ended up living there. Tavistock meaning connected to the Tavistock Institute in London. Yes. Wow. Yes. And that's it's a Tavistock cell, but it's actually a cult. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. That was part of the Anne Hamilton Byrne sect, which is quite well known. The Anne Angel. Byrne, right? Yes, um, it is. And the Hamilton name is name is within my family as well. I see. So the, yeah. So there's familial connections there with Anne Hamilton Byrne and the Hamilton name in general, which, so um, you as a toddler then, this begins, and did you then, um, were you then regularly sexually uh, abused and in, abused in this cult-like manner? Yes, unfortunately. So, you know, living with my father, it was whenever he had the access and, and wanted to do what he wanted to do, um, but he would- You have lived with him. You lived with yes. him. And your mother lived with you too? Yes, yes. Unfortunately, my mother, my father had an ability to uh, hypnotise her very easily. So it was just a rapid induction technique that he would use. It was very wow. effective. Um, so she would be out to it. And so we'd be abused in front of her and she wouldn't know. Wow. Like that. That's strong. So she was completely gone, like spaced out while you were being sexually abused by him in front of her. Yes, and then completely just gobsmacked when she would be brought out and we'd be hysterical and she wouldn't understand why. So he had special gift in that sense that he could um, induce this hypnotic state in your mother who was clearly very receptive to it also. Yeah, sure. So did he do things like that with you and the other children too? He did, yes. He had a technique with me, um, which became obsolete at one point, where he would tell me to um, everything that had just happened, it, it would just be locked away, um, and I would lock my lips so I wouldn't talk about it, and then I would take the key that had locked my lips and I would swallow it. And then at one point I eventually, and I've spoken about this in many interviews, I eventually said to him, but hang on, how can I open my lips to swallow the key when... <laughs> So then it became the drawer. I had to put it in the drawer. Yeah. I, <laughs> so this is sort of mind control training um, where you have a technique to lock away the memories so that it never happened. It's locked away in some part of your being that you have no access to. Yeah. So that's, uh, so it's classic mind control training there. Or do you feel that he was learning that somewhere or was told to do this or you do? Yeah. Um, I had a person come into my life um, that he knew from when she was very young. She was trained and she would purr. She would purr like a cat around him. So, you know, she was obviously either that was their joke about the beta sex kitten training or it was just something she had no control over. I'm not really sure. She'd meow and, and purr and carry on. And this was her, a lover of his? That's how she came into your lives? Wow. Yeah. And in front of your mother? Thankfully, my mother wasn't aware of her, but I thought that they um, had a connection from a certain point 
Whereas she actually told me that that was actually not the case. It had been 20 years longer than that. And they had met when she was only 15. So, but she was quite high up. Um, she has um, common research fellows with Graham Burroughs, who's very high up in the MK Ultra programming in this country. So, um, and I think, I think he might've been. Involved. So you're talking about the cult, which is also the network, what I call the network. Um, so you're talking about the inside the, in, of the network in Australia. So when you say it's known, it's not really known to the general public, but it's known to you. It's known to your family because everybody knows that this girl who at 15 was basically taken by your father or chosen or whatever, and then trained, and then she then did well within that cult, within that network. Yes, she did. Which was also connected to other uh, branches, at least, we know. Yeah. So your father, you know, the first memory that you described, there is already brutal murder, um, dismemberment. So it's, it's extremely, like you said, grotesque. So he is... Uh, um, I know that there's several children, so you have your two, your brother and your sister who are also aware of the abuse and have also tried to speak out. And then there's other siblings that are not, that are believe, believe that nothing happened and that are in denial. That's, that's the story that they give. Yeah, I don't understand how they could possibly be in denial, but that's the story that they give, yes. That's very common though, right? Even in incest families that uh, it's actually uncommon in my experience that there's more than one sibling who is speaking out. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So yeah. your brother's been very vocal and your sister Ruth has been very vocal as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it just strengthens everything. And uh, when we get into this other case, um, so you as a as a as a very very little girl are being exposed to these things and you're saying this occurred regularly so the sexual abuse by your father that must be something that's very regular yes. and even even in front of your mother maybe in front of your other siblings or were you did was he abusing you in front of each other or yes was. So we're completely no boundary we're doing everything like he thinks there's nothing wrong with any of this, obviously. Yeah, yeah. He acts like there's nothing wrong with any of that. Yeah. And 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 so I I know that you've shared some things about that. So there's you know this 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 one technique that he taught you not to speak out, not to remember actually, not not to speak yeah. out. Yeah. And I'm sure there's many more. Um, Something that really stu stuck with me that you shared before, and I wonder if you don't mind sharing it again, is that so there's often the, these talks about survivors that talk about having been in some kind of a tunnel system. And it's very hard for people to believe that because why, you know, like what underground tunnel systems where there's children being abused. So you have remembered um, being in a tunnel, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So where I grew up in Edwardstown on a, on a street called Macklin Street, there was an old telecommunications bunker. It was originally a um, Wonderlix brick kiln. And the reason it was at a lower level than, than the street level was because as the clay in that area was being dug out, these brick kilns were being built at the lower level and eventually fill was brought in. And my father would talk about how, you know, the dirt in the backyard, well, that, that came from, I think he said something like the, the local tip or something. I can't remember what he said, where it came from. Wingfield, I think he called it. So I don't know where the... The, the local was. what? The local what? Uh, tip, uh, as in the dump. So oh, think, um, oh. When he mentioned Wingfield, that I only remembered as a child going out there because we'd go out there occasionally and look through the rubbish because he was he was forever finding things. He was always collecting things. Oh, bags. he was a hoarder? Very much so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so that fill was brought in and then all of those old brick kilns and there were many in the area. I mean, this, this factory that was creating terracotta tiles and building these brick kilns was extensive. It was a really large area. It was industrial. Um, so the fill was brought in and people would then use those old brick kilns, which were quite large and create cold stores. And several of them were turned into telecommunications bunkers pre-World War II 
in the oh, 1938 wow. mandate. There was a mandate, government mandate, and everybody had to have a tunnel or a trench or a bunker oh. within 20 feet of their back door. Oh, so it was war-related originally. Yes. Yeah, I grew, I, there were bunkers where I grew up too, so okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got to wonder, you know, that was such a clever thing to do. If you wanted to have underground trafficking, you get everybody in these countries to build tunnels and bunkers. So it was a mandate, so everybody, but, but you could think that it's sincere anyway on the surface. You can say, well, you know, you have to protect from bombs. There certainly were also bombs. I mean, I grew up. Yes, but um, but so the tunnel system was already there, yeah. and it's just that we we supposedly had no idea that it was being used for anything at all. Correct? Yeah, yeah. So, and so, so the, yeah, brick kilns were there. They were turned into telecommunications bunkers. They had to put in an extensive tunnel system into the area I grew up in because of the industrial workforce there. They had to house thousands, sorry, hundreds of people. So six hundred or so in the local area where I was. Um, where, where my house was in particular. So between 1923 when or 26 when the expansion occurred and that brick kiln was built um, and 1938 when all the tunnels went in, that was all pretty much set up for when my father came in and then built a house on the property. And then when he built the house, he built a hidden cellar as well. And oh. so even my brother and I have even discussed how we got the bricks because I was trying to find if I can find the location of where the bricks were for the cellar, I could then possibly identify receipts or something some some way of working out where how he'd got hold of them but he'd actually um had a brick press or a brick brick making machine huh. that my brother saw because my brother was 19 years older than me and he was there when the house was being built so yeah my father had a plan he had a plan well, he when built the house basically on top of the tunnel system already yes and then there was a secret cave it's underneath something. the house but it led so how did your father used you in the in that system. I mean, yeah. what happened? So I was taken you? down during, usually, it was usually evenings. So it was usually after my mother had gone to bed. I would be woken up and I would be taken down through the through the tunnel system, taken to other people's cellars, um, other bunkers. To other people's and, cellars and, underground. Yes. So you would then find yourself in a, a different house, but in their cellar. Yes. yes. Ew. Yeah. It's so gruesome. It is. And exactly. that's to say you were being be trafficked this way, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So this is these people then knew that you were coming, let's say, oh, yeah. and they would then come and find you in the cellar to abuse you. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. And a lot of that was filmed, photographed. Um, On top of everything, they were abusing you, but they were also using it to create child porn material. Yeah. And a, a lot of those people were being blackmailed because many of them were very, very out to it. They were woken up for the for the, for the photographing or the filming oh. while I was doing things to them. Oh, so I see. So, so they were asleep. So your father, because of this tunnel system, had access to people's homes. So if he, he, your father was there... He told you to start doing a sexual act on a sleeping person yes. and then he would film it and then wake them up and then they would be caught in the act but they didn't even know what no and it was me got into their bedroom then like you no i think they were brought in so i would say most of them were drugged and my um, father had an extensive when they were brought in so they were brought into one of these houses on the tunnel system and was this happening in the cellars then or inside the homes i remember mostly being underground wow so there were probably times where i was taken up but oh that is sketchy and most of it was in pitch dark as well so oh. my father had these telecom issues so with the telecommunications um people that he worked for had these little pen lights the little a light on, the, on what looked like a pen, basically, a tiny little thing. And he would light the way with this little tiny pen light so you could barely see where you were going. And then the setup would occur. And I would hear other people's voices, so other people knew I was coming. But when I got in, their lights were off. And so all I would see was the flashes. Um, there was child pornography created in the cellar underneath our home and at, at Channel 9 Studios, but not... At Channel 9 Studios? Yeah, and also at the studio. Channel 9 Studios at the mainstream... Yeah television station yeah. in the area yeah. and 
at the studios inside or underneath the studios? No, actually, um, in a radio booth. Um, so, and so, I. So, who your fa- was it? Your father who had access to that building? My father, and another family member who worked there. Okay, and so it's interesting to point out that um, Debbie Marshall, who wrote a book called Banquet, um, the the family about the family murders, she actually says in her book that my father worked for Channel Nine Studios. I know that he was involved with them, mm-hmm. but she actually said in her book, she's a, an investigative journalist, that he actually worked mm-hmm. for them. Wow. So your father has this role. It's not completely clear, but he's maneuvering a lot. So when you're saying that these people were brought there in the, the basements, they were drugged, so they're not in a good place already. But now I'm assuming that to film this act, they turned on the lights. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so they're woken up, but they actually have days because they've been drugged. You're performing a sexual act on them, so now they have this damaging material. Um, so this is people that they they needed to indoctrinate or needed to control. control. Your father, and your would your father be the one controlling these people, or would that would he was he working? Do you think for someone else? Some of the time, it was my father's voice directing, but there were other voices that usually directed. I so see. He was, he was important, but not that important. And I was but just. The materials like, themselves must have been important to somebody that maybe was not him. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so then, okay. So the lights are turned on now. There's this damaging material created. And then there's Channel 9 Studios where you were also brought and abused there or made to, you know, whatever, made to perform sexual acts yeah. in the radio booth. Yeah. yeah. And there, was it the people? that were working there or was it it was yeah so it so was, was a radio jock that's died he raped me and that was filmed oh um, wow. and there was also a man in a, what we had a cut not cutting character a, a, a character called humphrey be bear um who was a man in a, in a bear suit presumably a man um and there were nine of those bear suits apparently at the channel nine studios and on that occasion where I was raped by the radio jock, I was also raped by a man in uh, the top half of the Humphrey Bear suit. And I was only very small at the time. And I had actually... Written very small, meaning you were like two, three... I watch it all the time. So I think that was part of it, that that, that, that was something that I really, really loved. Yeah. So they, they assaulted me um, and well, I was actually raped. And, and you, was, were, you were very young when you say very young, you were like three, four? About three. About three. three. Then shortly afterwards, so three else years old. So I just want to sit. With, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> three years old. I just want to be with that for a moment, you know, because it's. I know that your life is really extreme, and then, and then at the same time, it's like you're such a little girl, yeah. and the devastation, you know, of your favorite character from TV, obviously, being raped, um, must be part also of well. I know that everything gets perverted um, in those circles, but then you also have your own training, I guess, yes, to not trust. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I couldn't stand that show after that, that's for sure. Right, um, right. Because my family member worked at Channel 9, Yeah. Humphrey Bebert or someone wearing the suit was then brought to my home after that assault, and I was forced to be filmed with him in the backyard. In the backyard of all places, yes. just kind yes. of open, openly. Yes. So it must and, have felt my mother very. Not to understand why I didn't want to be part of it. <sighs> well, and the the thing that it's in the backyard, and that there's porn created in the backyard. Your father must have been very cocky, very sure that he would not be caught, right? Because it's almost like doing it in public, basically. Yeah. Basically. Anybody could see you. I'm assuming. Well, with the backyard filming was all above board. Isn't it sweet? Humphrey's come to visit, you know. And, and oh, I so see. So there was no life. child porn so created wasn't... in the backyard. Oh, I see. There was a program created in your backyard, but it was the same man who had raped you, or it was the same character. Right. Yeah, same character. Same oh same goodness. Character. Yeah. Okay, I'm clear. I'm clear. Wow. I'm sorry, Rachel. So horrible, horrible, and and. 
Now, I know that your siblings were also being abused. Um, so were, was there any kind of like togetherness um, like with them or were you pitted against each other or how was that? I know they were older too. And we were pitted against each other. So um, in our dynamic, well, the dynamic between myself and my closest in age siblings who were five and seven and a half years older than me, um, they were very, very close. You're the youngest? I'm the youngest. I see. Yeah. yeah. So I was the snitch apparently um, and I was – what does that mean in that sense? Uh, so I dobbed on them. Apparently I dobbed on them. And I've heard um, because my father had three siblings, mm -hmm. three children beforehand. There was mm -hmm. one within those three that was also considered the snitch. So, so how, how did you supposedly snitch on them? To whom? To your father? Uh, I remember one incident where I did that, but apparently I did it all the time. But I wasn't, I don't have memory of it. Where I, But it was, was, you were basically reporting, Yes. Basically, yes, yes, that's that's fine. I want to get to that because, I mean, there's still a little bit from these um, underground uh, the tunnels. <laughs> uh, there's an experience that you've related about being made to alone in a small uh, space around. Yes, and do, 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 I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Sorry that's to okay. bring it up. So that was my. Um, that was my sensory deprivation training, I believe. So my father would take me down. So the tunnels that we lived on top of were, were quite sort of narrow, but there were other areas where there were much wider, larger tunnels. And there was one very large water tunnel that you could walk through comfortably that was quite wide. So, and that had these subsidiary smaller tunnels that would have a, an opening oh, roughly about that wide. So you've, you've got a, a circle, you know, a tunnel of that space. He had, um, with this telecommunications work, they would have these barrels that the that the wires or the, the cables would come off. He had one of those that he would squish into this this tunnel opening so that once I was placed in there, I couldn't get out. Oh, goodness. Um, and he had, this, this was elaborate, Anika. He had um, fashioned it in a way that he could actually open up a little small hatch so that he could put food through or that he could actually look through. Oh, so you were before. there for a long time. You were even, you even, you were there so long, you even had to be fed because I know that that's not really, they're not generally in the network so considerate that they're going to give you food. You just help yourself when, whenever you can. So he must have known that had you, had he not fed you, you would have died. And it, it wasn't his plan to kill his own children, obviously. No, no. Were you supposed to follow in his footsteps? Uh, yes. Become part of the cult that he was? He, he would surgically uh, assault his victims, and he wanted me to do the same. And he openly wanted me to be. I'm sorry, the, the, word, the word surgically, did you say? Surgically, so uh, like a surgeon. So he would cut into his victims oh. and sew them up and things. Oh. And so, and that's what he wanted me to do. Oh, he won. Oh, goodness. He won. Okay. I'm sorry. It's all right, darling. It's all right. It's just the truth. It has to be said. Yeah. yeah. So um, your sensory deprivation training, as you call it, um, you couldn't count the days, obviously, because it was dark. Um, and there was, so when you say sensory deprivation, you, you, there's nothing there, right? You were just in this very small space. You couldn't stretch out, I'm assuming. I could stretch out when I was small. It stopped when I think I was about four or five. Oh, it happened a lot. Yes. Yeah. So um, only when I was very small. Very small. And you were left there for a long time. Yeah. Wow. And there was no point other than that you think it was part of the training? I, I know that when he came to get me and I was so appreciative to see him, oh. I think that was something that he really enjoyed. He had done something horrible, but I would give him so much affection. Until the day that I said I didn't want him to remove me, remove me, I wanted to stay in there because I would have these out-of-body experiences where I would have 
I would go off with the angels or they would actually come and visit me and a light would come in and I would be warmed up because it was always freezing cold in there. And on one of those occasions, he'd come shortly after one of those events and I didn't want to leave. <laughs> so I remember kicking and screaming and trying to get back in the tunnel and he was <laughs> Kind of backfire there, but yeah. uh, so uh, narcissistically doing this to you, which you know, this complete deprivation of everything except a little food to keep you alive. He was then your savior and he enjoyed the the love that you then gave him for, for saving him this, this sort of completely um, psychopathic pleasure of, um, you know, create making your, your own child <laughs> victim completely dependent on you in this most desperate way and then that kind of fear-based love um that's what he that's what he enjoyed yeah mm. wow and what a childhood huh yeah yeah when you and, think and, about it, you know, it's 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 horrific horrific and then yet you're already describing that when you were like, you know, you said you were in that place there um, in that tunnel, you know, it ended when you were five years old. And so you were getting help spiritually already. Yes, it was. So you were being made warm. <laughs> you were having outer body experiences, but you didn't feel alone, it sounds like. No, no, it ended up being probably one of the most profound spiritual experiences of my life and a series of them in that space so i was i was not alone but i remember prior to that wishing i was dead so i didn't have to be in that space and that's when they would come in so it, it's um yeah it's quite quite amazing really and it's interesting because they were whatever this was it was intelligent and would communicate with me and i would be shown aspects of the future that would then come true so it was it was quite amazing really yeah it builds faith <laughs> it does it does it's hard not to have faith in those circumstances yes and i say that a lot to people yeah it's yeah, easy it's when you've had those experiences yes and it's like near death experiences as well you know how can you doubt it when you've been there exactly it's a, it's, it's it's your personal experience no one can no one it doesn't matter what anyone says <laughs> no no, exactly. You know. Yeah. And uh, so amazing, too, that so many um, survivors have these experiences, to have that help in these extreme circumstances. Um, um, so having this man as a father and then your mother, who was extremely passive and very easily, you know, hypnotized. <laughs> um, and... Um, your siblings also being abused, were you being the youngest um, of five, is it? Six at that six, point. Six, six children, so he had a lot of children. <laughs> There's another one that was born in the 80s after me that I didn't meet until the 2000s. 2012. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So he had lots of children, yeah. He had a secret family two streets away. <laughs> like this was... Uh, let's say a deceptive on every level, but also a complete psychopath. So um, before we go uh, and talk a little bit about the, 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 the Beaumont uh, children case, I, I just wanted to ask you, um, I think you've shared with me once that you were mind control trained to be a recorder. Yes. yes. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about that? So, so children have certain gifts and abilities and when you are exploited by um, something like a you know MK programmer, um, they will find the things that you have, the, the, the abilities that you have, the strengths, and they will capitalise on it. Absolutely. So one of mine was that I did have a very good memory. I had a photographic memory. So I would I would see things in my memory. So there'd be all these timestamps and, and, you know, lighting and you know the, the way that i've been able to work out when i've been writing out my statutory declarations of my abuse is what time of year was it what am i wearing do i feel cold do i feel warm in that memory what's the sunlight where is the sunlight in that moment because the the snapshots are very clear mm. um so that's actually been of great benefit to me as an adult sure exactly so i <laughs> just wanted to ask yeah 
then that's what we're going to talk about in a minute. And that's why I wanted to ask you, you know, so the programmers notice that you have this gift, yeah. you know, they figure it out and photographic memory is valuable. So what did they, what, what was the idea? What did they do then to enhance that, uh, for example, or they, and when I say they, is that, is this your father? Is this someone else? My father had alters. So he had multiple personalities and one or two of those considered themselves to be an, a whistleblower. And, and a whistleblower? Was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Of whom? <laughs> or what? Uh, he would, he would, well, he had communications with federal police and he's written about this in letters that I have managed to get hold of, where he describes that my sister, for example, who was murdered in 2009. Oh, this is murdered in 2009. Yeah, yeah a supposed suicide. But even my father wrote to the coroner and said she, she was murdered. And his excuse was that it was because of his whistleblowing to federal police. I see. Um, and, and he was also part of the union. And he also mentioned that his, his important role in the union had also got her murdered. Your sister, is this your sister, Ruth? No, this is my sister, Claire. Claire I'm was sorry. just about to make allegations. She was with Ruth. And Andrew, on the day that the Beaumont children were brought to our home, deceased in the boot of a car, um, she had to. She and my sister Ruth were taken by our father to look at the de dead children in the boot of the car, and he showed them various things about the bodies. Claire kept quiet until the day before her death. She'd made an appointment to go and see detectives at the major crime department, and then the next day she was found dead. Now my sister Claire was very vain extremely vain but she supposedly hung herself now what's really interesting is she somehow supposedly broke her own neck no I, I i i totally get it and yeah. obviously the timing is insane and she never spoke until that day yeah and then you're you're okay i i'm i just want to go back a little bit because i mean i want to obviously go there later but your father you said he had altars, and one of these altars was a whistleblower, which um, he thought he was a whist whistleblowing um, about the Beaumont oh, children. About or police corruption. About police police corruption, corruption, I see. Who police? Okay. Police yeah. corruption. And um, how did he, how did, did he, was he the one who saw your gift of the photographic memory and thought you would be a great recorder? And so what did he do to train you then more specifically? He would tell me um, a lot of things about politics that I had absolutely no interest in. So I didn't retain much of that information, but he would also tell me about all of his friends and what they were doing. Um, and he would tell me about these surgical techniques that he wanted me to learn. Um, he took me through the tunnel system, when, whereas he hadn't, there is, there is one family member that I know went down in the tunnel system because I saw them in there, but they won't speak about it. Um, and there's a there's a third who mentions being underground. Um, there's a one. A third a third sibling was also mentioned being underground. Mm -hmm. They knew about it too, and they told another of my siblings about that. They didn't tell me about that directly. Um, so, so your father told you a lot of things, yeah. but not because you were his confidant, but because he, he wanted, wanted me to talk him. about it later. He wanted me to talk about it later, Anna. Okay. He that's the that's the, the 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 weird whistleblower um, who wanted you to remember everything. Yeah. Is it sort of a vain thing on his part that he you know he wanted his deeds, his evil deeds, to be known to the world? I think that there is that that aspect because there was the evil Max persona as well that was t totally evil um, and totally devoid of any kind of compassion. He wanted he wanted to show off. But there was also this part of him that felt like everything had been done to him, that he was the victim and that he had been forced to do these things. So he would he would vacillate in between. Um, and That's also very common, right, for abusers. They're they're ultimately they're the victim. They've never passed, you know, beyond you no know, age two emotionally. So they're yes. always the, 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 the little helpless victim at the end of the day. And that's why there's no accountability. It goes together very well. Um, these personalities, let's say, you know, the one that feels like the victim is fueling up to do the harm because there's no accountability, obviously, if you're the victim always. And it's the harm is like constant revenge, mm -hmm. uh, unconscious revenge on whatever was done to him. 
as a child that he just could never heal from, obviously. Um, and and I'm sorry if that sounds, if I speak about psychologically about someone who is, you know, a monster in, in most people's eyes and, and you're, you are, you know, a real whistleblower. You are really talking about what he really was like. And I don't mean to diminish any of the reality of that. I just always go to the psychology just to um, to take it back to you, you know it 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 it's not an excuse ever, but it is also something that is if we don't know the psychology, we can we can never make a change in that regard either. So that's what I want to. That's why I keep bringing that out. So <laughs> thanks for indulging me. No, no, I agree with you wholeheartedly because I know that you've been through horrific abuse and you spend a lot of your adult life thinking, how can somebody do something like that? Right. Because it's not in us to do it. Right. And the only way to really understand it is, and for me, I've done the same. I've thought, why would he, why would he be so broken? Why would he do th th that? And I know that it, something happened to him. I really do believe something happened to him. I had an opportunity once to ask him if he'd ever been raped by a male. Um, I was sitting in the car with him and he was horrified that I would even ask him that because he was so homophobic. He was obscenely homophobic. <laughs> he was homosexual. He, he was every kind of sexual. He was a necrophiliac, he, everything. He didn't really care. Oh. Bestiality, everything. Oh. He had this issue with men being openly camp. And he would just go on and on and on about it. It was bizarre. Right. But, but he was engaging with men regularly. I saw it. So, it, but And boys, men. obviously. <gasps> and boys also, obviously, yes. yeah. Yeah, boys, children, everything. But so... Your your father, who is every kind of sexual, so you know clearly a lot would have happened to him as a child, and then the killings, the surgical killings. And um, there's a question whether he was also in an, a network as a child, and that he passed everything on, or that he fit really well because of psychopathy. Um, yeah. So the 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 cutting the bodies up and up and everything. Um, I find that that's, you know, like the, the, the inner deaths that happen whenever a child, you know, loses hope um, that, and the inner, the, 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 that part, that child dies, then, you know, the only way to, when that gets activated, that, that despair, that hopelessness is to kill and to get on the other side of that hopelessness is to, to kill and for that moment and have the high of, um, so I don't want to talk too much about that, but we're talking about a real psychopath and your father. And it's, I don't want to humanize him uh, particularly, you know, uh, but at the same time, there's these, um, we're still talking about human beings and how they get like, you know, like that, that's the question. Uh, how did your father, your own father, it must be quite something to be his daughter, really, you know, to know that this is your father. Yeah, it is. Um, I Just just on that, I just thought it would be important. I've, I've shared this a lot on social media, but my father was a Freemason. He was a Satanist, a Luciferian, a Freemason, a Golden Dawn member. Um, and a what member? A Golden Dawn. Golden, Alistair Dawn. Crowley's Golden, Dawn. Golden Dawn. Golden Dawn. Alistair Crowley. My father's grandfather was a man called Joseph Wright, who was the Grand President of the Grand Lodge. And I've been told that's a very, very high up Freemason. Now, my father's mother was an Order of Australia medal recipient, which is like an OBE. She was a JP. She was very high up in politics. So oh. she, and this is going back, you know, when women didn't have any power. So she was a very powerful woman, probably because of who her father was. So, um, and there's, it's interesting because Wright is another word for, perhaps for Mason. McIntyre means son of a mason. So I think that there's a family line there that sort of, it's very unlikely that my father would have been born into that family line and not have been abused himself. I think it's highly, highly Really, likely. And thank you for clarifying that too, because yes, there's always so much about the the names and the bloodlines. And yes, that it's definitely the trainings, um, the, the abuse, the, the murders. Um, and so then being his children and the fact that he came from 
this lineage, then yes, you would not be killed, but you would be rather trained to become like him. And um, so he chose you to become like him in ter- sort of the, what you call the surgical killings. Um, so as a recorder, I, 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 I thought that, you know, I know that some uh, survivors were used as robots or as laptops in a way, and they, they record, and it's in order to spy for, you know, for spying purposes. Were you used in that way as well? I was used psychically that way. Oh. But I was taken into an alter state. So I could remote view, and I still do that for a living. Um, and you I do that for a living. That's to say you're a psychic. Yes, you're not a, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so not, not in any, any, any capacity as anything like a, an intelligence operative, God, God, no. Um, but just, just in my work, um, if people have lost something, they'll ring me and I'll, I'll locate it for them. <laughs> so it's good to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can be helpful. It can be helpful. Um, so I was used as a spy, I suppose, as a child through my psychic ability. But I was always taken into an altered state when that was done. So I wouldn't necessarily have a memory of that afterwards. I've got memory of it now because I've accessed those um, those parts. But that would um, the recording factor was also he would, for instance, we would drive past a certain location, and it's the location where I mentioned that these two men were dismembered um, when I was a very small child and was just able to stand. Mm-hmm. There was a bakery next door. There was a, there was a house, a bakery and a butcher, and they're all on the same property and they're all involved with, okay. with what was being done there. And okay. I'd, I'd been uh, medically experimented on in one of those buildings. As we would drive past the bakery, my father would become Evil Max. That persona would take over. His face would change. He would turn around and look at me in the car and he would snigger about, I'll, I'll grind their bones to make my bread. Uh-oh. And he would point to the bakery or he would point to the butcher as we would go past and he would he would make some other, um, you know, musical, it's often very sing-song voice that he would oh, use wow. about the butcher. Okay. You know, that butcher had a particular sticker on it when I was a child that had, yeah, some pretty horrible things going on in there. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, yes, so how would you... So you would you you would record this and then he would expect you to. Um, he was saying it on purpose for me to remember it because I wasn't I wasn't. So, okay, so you were supposed to know what was happening in there. Yeah. Gotcha, 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 yeah. gotcha. Yes. So, yes. Again, I want to keep it. So, like, yeah. <laughs> so many things you can talk about. I understand <laughs> because it's. You know, it's um, our stories are so extreme. You know, so there's there's what we share. I mean, you have shared about a lot, and I invite everyone to um, look at your materials because you actually have a whole lot. So I do want to mention, though. Um, so I, if there's anything of your own you know, childhood that you went through that I feel like we really missed because I'm getting a picture and obviously there's a few vignettes and uh, I'm just horrified at the thought that growing up with this man that was your father um, in that family and I'm so sorry. Um, Is there something about your childhood that you feel that should be shared um, here? Well, for those who don't understand how this could take place, because I've talked about rituals where there were 50 adults present at least and, and a number of us children, probably nine or ten of us children, and, you know, horrific things occurred. And I've been asked in other interviews, how is that possible? There must have been this conspiracy. Well, there was, there was, and it starts with the police in my state. Um, so my father had a very close friend whom two um, high-profile missing children were abused in front of and with and by. And... He was a chief high profile children. Guy. That's to say, high profile in terms of who their parents were, or high profile, high profile in the one one was had a famous father, and when he went missing, everybody knew who he was. And high profile is in there was a missing girl who miss who went missing six months before him. And those two those two missing children cases, for some reason, in the mainstream media, never linked 
but they were both abused together in the cellar beneath my father's home. Um, because there was a police officer who was a chief inspector of police at that time involved, everything that you try and get past police just gets shut down. It's so, the, so your father had the connections as well, yes. and then it's a lodge, so there may be other people in the police force that are that are making sure that it's not going anywhere, yes. and none of this and is because going. there was this blackmail stuff going on. I believe that was political. The blackmail was part of it too. I, I see. Gotcha. So gotcha. You've got a, an, an, a, an operative who's been given carte blanche to do these things so that they can control people, they're never going to investigate it. And every time I've got things close to being looked at in the past, up until yeah. um, 2016 when things actually started to move forward and there were there was actually an investigation being taken place in, into my father, but then he died, um, the response I would get from police is it's an operational matter. And so an operational matter means it's got something to do with uh, things that the police will not touch. But sorry, we're just not going to touch it. It's an operational matter. Now, an operation, an operation meaning it's a, it's ASIO. It means nothing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so this is, okay. <laughs> yeah. So you, I asked for some numbers because I have listened to your talks and we have talked privately. And so I'm just going to give a few numbers because we're going to talk a little bit about it and we're not going to go into all the details because it's yes. exhaustive. I mean, you're a recorder. You are a recorder. You yes. have all the details listed and you have all the uh, paperwork to back everything up. And, and you have a video listed on your channel where your father basically to clear his name in the case of the Beaumont children, the missing Beaumont children, basically says that he was involved. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, he just, he didn't do the killing, but he was no, he blamed, he blamed his, blamed friend. his friend. Yes. He's now a convicted pedophile. Yeah. Yes. So in the past 17 years, you contacted and interacted with over 100 people in 21 or more positions of authority and our police departments yeah. about the Beaumont children that, case of the missing children uh, went missing in 1966 and other crimes by your father and not uh, least of which is the crimes of his pedophile ring which abused you as a child so over a hundred people in 21 or more positions of authority police the so i can just imagine in terms of and i have a list <laughs> we have a list of all the outreach that you've done all the attempts that you've made, and then you have recorded their responses, and you've recorded the uh, lack of follow up, or you know your attempts to follow up, and then the lack of <laughs> responses. Yes, it's not as if there is no. It's like the Dutu case, you know. Everything was there. It's and it takes so much work not to look, and it is so incredibly ludicrous. You, th the facts are all there. The common common sense tells you uh, for sure. The pictures speak a thousand words. Yeah. Your father's own admission on video. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and not, not the least also that your brother um, and your sister, as you mentioned earlier, were shown the bodies of the children and had to do things to get the sand out of their hair and the blood or, or something, correct? Or out of the car, out of the trunk of the car. My, my two sisters were shown the bodies. My brother was present on the day, saw the commotion, but wasn't shown the bodies. So I my see. father used his daughters as his as his uh, recorders. I see. So two of his daughters saw the bodies. The son was there. A friend of your brother, Andrew, also wrote in a diary yes. that... In, he was on that beach, Clinic Beach, how do you call it? Glenelg. 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 Yes. <laughs> beach, which, and it was Australia Day in 1966, so crowded day. Um, so uh, could you talk about the diary, which is another um, circumstantial evidence? 
So um, my brother Andrew McIntyre was also a co-contributor to the diary. It was written by a local boy. I won't mention his name. Um, and it basically put my father, Anthony Munro, my brother Andrew McIntyre, who was about 12 at the time, this local boy, and multiple other persons of interest. Now, there was another member that was named in that diary who was sexually abusing me throughout my childhood. Um, so if, if that had been properly investigated back then, I might have been saved from... You know from who that, that, can you say who that was? I'll just give his initials as um, WB, although we've recently discovered that he might have had a, a previous initial JWB. So we've recently found out that he may have had a first name. But these people often have three names and they will use their middle name. They, they won't use their official first name. They'll use their middle name. Everybody will know them by that. So my father was a perfect example. Alan Maxwell McIntyre, but everybody knew him as Max. Oh, got you. So, so, these so people of interest were all visiting um, Glenelg Beach in the days and weeks prior to that disappearance of those children. Um, my father also worked at the telecom exchange in Glenelg, so he had reason to be. There. So he was. He worked right there. Yes. Yeah. So he was surveying. I could say they they were they were surveying that beach, and then. Did your father also admit that his friend um, Monroe had killed the children? He blamed Monroe for the children's death. Yes. Alan Monroe, right? Your father blamed Monroe for the children's death, but Anthony your sisters saw the bodies in the in your father's car. Yes, in the boot. Yes, in the boot, which is a trunk, right? Yes. <laughs> A little different word. Yeah. So yeah. so these were three siblings, the Monroe, uh, the Beaumont children. Um, they disappeared from that beach. Yeah. And then um, there was talk about a blonde man being there around that time also that witnesses had seen many reports. Now, Alan Monroe is blonde, is he, is he not? Yes, he is. Yeah, right. so it could easily, easily have been. Um, so it's Anthony Allen Munro. Quite often in these articles. Oh, again, so another third name them, <laughs> and you know it's Anthony Allen Munro. They've all got these three names. Yeah, um, but my father also had a habit of wearing this blonde wig. So oh, I I you know. said he had a wig, yeah. right? Because the yeah. face for the 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 robot picture that is drawn kind of looks like your father's nose. Yeah. 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 Yeah, There's, the similarities there. There's there's another theory that it was he was an that the, the this guy supposedly that that identikit photo is supposed to supposedly look like some other person of interest. It doesn't look anything like that other person of interest. Yes, and that's and you, why I did that comparison with my father because I think in comparison to this other much chubby, round faced man, that yes. this is, is the other other person of interest. It's just who was in jail. He was, he was in prison, correct? Um, no, the other person of interest is a guy called Harry Phipps that they keep desperately trying to blame the the Beaumont children disappearance on. They they and this is a this is a police theory that they they just keep bringing it out. Right. So it's like this other person. Yes. So basically, uh, similar in the two case, something similar happened. Um, but so you have the pictures and next to each other, yeah. and so we'll show those pictures here. Also, um, you know, the person of interest by the police, nothing uh, at all resembling the picture, the robot picture. And then you have that picture of one of the friends of your father. Uh, one, one of your father looks exactly like him. And these pictures, these very creepy pictures, by the way, where there are, they're always fishing. They are much too chummy with those little boys. Yes. We don't know who these little boys are. Yeah. Um, uh, Anthony Allen Monroe ended up moving to Cambodia, correct? Yes, he did. Yes. I mean, it's just. It's <laughs> and, My brother, but yeah. it took 10 years, 10 years to have Anthony Monroe incarcerated for what he did to my brother and another man who doesn't wish to be named. 10 years and I was writing letters during that time so what I've what I've chronicled what I've what I've written out for you I don't I don't even have in there what I did on behalf of Andrew to try and get Anthony Munro incarcerated because he needed help with that um and and what my sister did and this is a case of well. sexual abuse of an of a minor so in a way you could say 
it's not the kind of high profile case. There's no murder. It's sexual abuse of a minor and so difficult, yes, to get him to justice. And so Anthony Allen Monroe, there is this incredibly creepy moment on this video um, where your father, and we'll link that video here too, where your father actually describes walking into a room where Monroe is abusing your minor brother. Yes. But he says they were in bed together I didn't say anything. I didn't want to say anything. My boy was in love with his scout leader. That's your father's take on that. Yes. Now, Munro was never Andrew's scout leader. So, number one, that's that's <laughs> my father lying. But the fact that he would find them in bed like that and not make a scene and then blame it on Andrew, saying that Andrew was in love with his scout leader, oh, my God. Yes, your it's father incredible. is really inc incredible. completely and utterly insane yes and um and it's incredibly creepy to watch the video but i think people want to see this person um basically admit that he knows that he's very involved with those beaumont and then your documentation of all the attempts you've made to try to bring this information you Obviously, there was your sister, Claire, who was about to, she got killed, your brother making numerous attempts to report also what he knew, your other sister, Ruth, as well, making new, then, then this has gotten some media attention, but really not very much. It's always to the police say that they have thoroughly investigated this case and there is no indication, no leads, except it's all leads. They're all leads. Yes. They're all very obvious. They're all, it's like you, you're handing them everything. So there's again, the question, because in your childhood, you've never mentioned I mean, you've mentioned the woman who worked uh, the, your your own family as uh, some being high up in politics, but you've never really mentioned perpetrators internationally, famous perpetrators or anything like that. Your father was not an important man in that sense. I mean, there's the lodge, but other than that, he's a small fry. Yeah. Why? What do you think is the reason for this ridiculous protection that he's enjoyed his entire life? Well, it's interesting. My brother mentioned in an in a interview that he believed it's because they saw him as some sort of um, demigod. I don't know how to describe it. Pharaoh. So they were all into the Egyptian deities. And my father had abilities. He could do things. So this is the cult inside the cult, which 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 counted some members of the police force and certainly some that were high enough in the police force to be able to doctors, judiciary, very powerful people just in my state. Yeah. Okay, so they were the elite of the state. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So. Yes, yeah, so it's again, as far as the power pyramid goes, these were powerful people. Yeah. And then your father was popular among them because he, as a psychopath, he would be feared, <laughs> I would think. Yes. Because he was obviously doing things to people that may not have been good people, but they may not have been pedophiles, and he was making them look like pedophiles and so yes. forth. So these were yeah. people who would be quiet for the rest of their life or their career their family would be completely destroyed you know the that that and and this um this is a common tactic it's 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 like mob on steroids basically yeah yeah it's a form of mafia yeah and they're all in each other's pockets and they all own each other and the freemason oath because the the number one thing was that they're all masons is that they all protect each other and that overrides everything else, no matter what your position is, no, no matter what you're being paid to do, your your first loyalty is to your brother. Right, mm -hmm. to your brother, Mason. Yes. So um, you were groomed to become part of this group mm -hmm. by your father. Um, so what happened? So um, they tried to get me into a... Um, 
psychology. They wanted me to be, to be a psychologist. So, I mean, he wanted me to be a doctor and a surgeon, but I'm, I'm squeamish and I just refused to do anything that he wanted it's me to do. It's amazing to hear you say that you were squeamish because what you were exposed to, I mean, I guess you were you were sensitive and you never really fully lost the hor- the sense of horror of what you saw. No, I, no, I never did. I'm pretty hopeless when it comes to blood and stuff. I'm just useless. Um, and then at the same time, um, and I'm sorry to bring this up because this may be difficult also um, to speak about, but obviously all I and um, everyone I know was also made to do things to others yeah. uh, viol- with violence. And, and, and so you were, he wanted you to be that surgical killer. Yes. So he must have placed you in situations where you were forced to do things too. He did his very best to try and force me. So on one occasion, he put a knife in my left hand and then put both his hands around my left hand and then put a knife into a child and then tried to say it was my fault. Um, and I still cannot stand. Um, when I when I, I had an assessment with a psychiatrist um, in 2019, she said, are there any long-lasting effects? And I said, well, this is just one example. This is what I live with every day. I cannot stand the feeling of anything on the back of my hand, any warmth in anyone's hand, my hand. I can't touch the back of my hand without remembering that. Oh. So that, that's a daily thing where I'm constantly mm-hmm. adjusting myself because mm-hmm. I'll absentmindedly put my hand on my on the back of my left hand and I cannot stand the feeling. And you just get so this reaction. That's that's um, I'm because nearly... he killed that child. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, and that mm-hmm. happened forty years ago, and it's still a daily thing that I have to deal with. Absolutely, and he was killing this child, and now okay, so there's the the Beaumont children were missing. Do you know anything about his other victims in terms of the like, who this child might have been? Yeah, do? yeah, I do. So um, there's a child called Louise Bell who went missing in January of 1983. Um, there's also another child called Richard Kelvin who went missing in June. These children were from regular families and they were kidnapped. Yes. And then so killed, and they were killed. And had a very high up position as a newsreader, sorry, in, at Channel 9 Studios. So Richard's father was well known, but Louise's parents were not. So the children were basically kidnapped and in the case of the Channel 9 um, person, maybe a punishment or what? Do you know what? The- oh, I don't want to go into that too deeply, okay. Annika. Okay. Um, but just fine. to say that, that just- child was not not murdered by my father, but was um, abused and filmed with myself and the other missing child, Louise Bell, yeah. um, in the underground cellar. And my father took me to see a child in an underground facility that had been surgically mm-hmm. abused and had the same stitching in his abdomen that my father did to Louise um, to a different part of her body. And he told me as we were going there, I was going to go and visit Richard and I had this horrible feeling. And I don't know that that was actually him because again, I, he was using a pen light. I could barely see what was in there, but he made it very clear that I had to look at this abdominal injury. I thought the child or the young man was dead. They woke him up. However, they must have given him something because he was under, it was horrific. The smell was terrible. Um, I think either either that wasn't actually Richard or it was a different a different victim that he called Richard or he did that on purpose as misdirection. But um, they're two high-profile children that I know um, that I saw abused and witnessed dreadful things. Um, so basically, again, the police, um, there's these children that are going missing, which same in the Dutou case. Uh, Mark Dutou was kidnapping children in Belgium, um, although most network children were not coming from, were not being kidnapped. But in your father's case, it's like complete carte blanche, like you said, kidnapping children, and then uh, just this absolute beyond nightmarish um, and in what he did to them and making you see it. And then also taking your hand and uh, putting putting the knife in your hand and uh, making you do what supposedly he did then and forced then and then said you you did it and that was louise bell yes it was i'm so sorry yeah it's so it's it is really difficult because the horror of it you know there's 
when we watch um i mean i never watch of course uh i never watch um horror movies i can't no, okay. um but i don't think horror movies are any anything near this horror hor horrible this horrific no. and that's what we lived through and uh, that was your life yeah and you went to school in the yes. daytime and all of your siblings did as well you were a normal family yeah yeah to a, to a degree i mean one of my siblings was shipped off to my grandfather at just barely 14. oh so his his scholastic career ended at that point wow it was like it just didn't exist after that well oh, okay so not that normal but who knows right these things like there's a way to not um yes there's a way to not make a big deal about that and that yes. yeah yeah <laughs> so you didn't you knew you didn't want to be um you didn't want to be a surgical killer yeah. you knew you were squeamish so they were going to make you a psychologist yes and then what happened because how old are you now so at um 17 i finished my matric which is the end of high school um here in australia and i my my grades weren't great i couldn't get into a bachelor of arts or a bachelor of science degree the bachelor of science degree at that point was around about 79 percent i'd got it about 63. oh so so um you're not like some of the mind control slaves who have to have all a's all the time in in the united states the, the children of the satanic uh families are have um a's all around and then you know they're being sex they're being sexually abused and ritually abused but their uh front life is like perfect 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 yes. so that wasn't really the case for you no i did well in one subject i did get an a in one subject for my for my year 12 but um i got b and, and three c's for the other subjects so nothing special yeah i wasn't a very good student either <laughs> I was only good in languages. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, obviously, yes, very impressive. Um, I was only good at what I was interested in. So I was interested in art and <laughs> biology, but not the other subjects. But because I didn't get into the Bachelor of Science degree, and that's what my father and this other person wanted me to do, um, my father made a phone call and got me into Flinders University, um, into the wow. Bachelor of Science degree. Look at that, cult. With my cult connections. Yes. Wow. Yes, and I've got my transcripts to prove that that should not have occurred. <laughs> That's funny. You yes, you keep the record. Point. You keep the record. You have proof of everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when I applied under Freedom of Information, I had an anxious wait waiting, and I was just thinking, you know, they're not going to send it out to me. Of course, they won't send it out to me. That's the proof that I need, and they did. They still sent it out to me. It's like, wow. <laughs> they don't crazy. know you. They they didn't know you. That's why so um what, what what happened then so then i went into psychology i hadn't had i didn't do any maths chemistry or physics previous to going into that bachelor of science degree i didn't know what i was doing i i failed um but with the psychology aspect my father and this other person really wanted me to continue and i kept saying i don't understand it i can't do the statistics i don't have a mathematical brain i'm going to fail oh no 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 they said just turn up to the exams you don't even have to put pen to paper <laughs> everybody's every student's dream so. Yes. Yes. so at that point i withdrew until the end of the year and then get let, let it lapse and so that i failed so that there was no recourse but i didn't tell them what, what was happening i kept that secret but you there. did not want to do that you wanted to fail yes and why i was not going to just get a degree that I knew I wasn't qualified for. Wow. No so it's just incredible that you would have that integrity considering your upbringing. Yeah. Like, do you think that the experiences in the tunnel where you had these spiritual visits and little glimpses of the future, do you feel that you were being guided in some way? I don't know if it's just innate, Annika, or... I'm not sure. I just, it just wasn't in me. I just didn't want to be, I didn't want to remarkable. be. Remarkable. It's remarkable that you'd rather fail 
and suffer whatever comes with the failing, then um, allow your parents to have you cheat and pass. Um, and, you know, it's it's remarkable. I mean, in, in terms of you should have low self-esteem, you know, <laughs> you should have low self-esteem that could be that there's this invitation there for you to, hey, it doesn't matter. You have low self-esteem. You're actually special because we are going to put you, pass you anyway. So you're special. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, nope, I don't care. <laughs> Not doing it. Yeah, I, I could see it was a trap. I okay. it was a trap so I because the, as far as a trap that you would then, they would own you. Yes. Father yes. and his people would own you and you would be a psychologist for them yes yeah somehow innately on you i didn't have rec recall of all of my memories at that point i had some but not all but there was certainly not something i was going to walk into so you knew and that's why you chose against it very and and, and so how did you i mean your father you know he was still alive in 2016 he lived a long life he was never call to account, um, not for, for lack of trying by three of his children. How, it's really remarkable to me that, that three siblings have stood up against him. Yeah. And yeah. Family and basically uh, four, really. Uh, yeah, four, really, yeah. That spoke the truth, that wanted the truth to be known. So um, have you experienced any consequences from not going along with them? I've had threats. I've had trolling, uh, incessant trolling. Um, and I've had the, you know, not that I've ever really had any great uh, respect for police because I was abused by a policeman as a child. So I've been denigrated and laughed at and, and, and abused by police. Um, but for the most part, well, and losing my family. I mean, they're, they're the repercussions um, and the threats, of course, are terrifying. I've, I've had a pedophile turn up to uh, a place where people that I had a need to protect, he made sure that he that I saw him there. So, oh, um, all so right. I've had that as well. Um, right. That was charming. So, um, There's a, so, so it's like these... There, there. You understand, but no. Uh, but for anybody else, it doesn't mean anything. But yeah. you, you know what what it means, and you because you know the man, and you know what he's there for. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And he turned up to my workplace as well. Oh uh, wow! Cult, cult members. Yeah. And did so, you have I mean, any? I've had stalking. Sorry. I've had stalking in that way. You've you've been stalked, yeah, yeah. and. Um, did you have any programming um, to make sure you wouldn't speak out ever? To you know, did you do you have like uh, suicide programs that come uh, suicide thoughts or? So I definitely had the suicidal programming. So that I think you've mentioned it too, um, and it really clicked that if a man would leave me, that I would want to kill myself, and that did happen. Um, and it was really interesting because the person in question I wasn't actually really in love with it was it was the programming and it was very very hard to fight against but that was over 20 years ago um I've, I don't have any suicidal ideation now but I did struggle with it from from the age of seven um up until well early 30s probably it's certainly not an issue for me now not at all um oh gosh so much programming um so every time I speak out every time I have an interview I will go into fear mode afterwards for a certain period of time. I'm really um, sorry about that because obviously this is what this is. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's you know, I've done over 30 interviews now. I think this is number 37 or something like that. So it's gets, it gets better. It gets better. But each time I know I'll, I'll divulge more than I have in a previous interview or something different that I haven't divulged before, and that will be a focal point, and then I'll panic over that, panic over that. But I'll get over it. Um, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep. Those sorts of things happen. But mm -hmm. I'm I'm extremely lucky in that I am very, very stubborn and I won't be told what to do. Uh, and I'm lucky in that I don't substance abuse. Um, I I did I did drink and I and I um, dabbled in some things when I was younger. But I'm teetotal now. Coffee is my is my drug. <laughs> 
and I can only have one a day or I can't sleep. So <laughs> there's no escape from it. So I have to use other ways to escape from the from the stress um, and um, and the fear, and that is my spirituality. That's how I manage, and I know that you do the same. It's and nature, nature, nature is the most powerful healer. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well. You know, I, thank you for sharing that because obviously, you know, you're, we're doing an interview. You know that you're going to go in fear mode. And so the programming for these things, it was like trauma connected to, with repetition. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And threats. Then if you do A, then B happens. And so you go into fear mode because of what B would be. Yeah. yeah. And that was and deep into your... things told to me that these things would happen. Um, and so far they have not. And I know that they won't because um, I don't know if it's because I've heard other, other survivors talk about um, some of us survivors are allowed to sort of live because we're like a living sacrifice and they find it entertaining. And that's a possibility in my circumstance, or perhaps they think I'm a, um, uh, making a fool of myself and, and that it, it sort of strengthens their um, their case against me, I'm not really sure. But I've got to a point now where it, the, the fear of their retribution, it's it's much less than it used to be. And that's why I keep speaking out. And the physical health that I've, um, my improvements in health, because I was chronic pain and I was dreadfully unhealthy, that is, that is I mean, most of my physical ailments have left me. So, you know, coming to age 50 is pretty rare. Um, I'm a pretty, pretty physically healthy um, and relatively pain free. Wow. So speaking out has been very cathartic and it's helped me. Oh, fantastic. Yes, same here. <laughs> but yes, it does. It is not without consequences. So thank you for, for doing it. And, you know, I think this is a nice place to end unless there's something that you would really like to like to share before we close um only that i'm still trying to get the evidence out about the Edwardstown tunnel so if anybody wants to go and look at my Edwardstown tunnel video that came out in january of 2023 so this year um i'm on rumble and i'm on bit shoot um my name rachel vaughn rachel vaughn and it's Edwardstown, right Edwards like e-p-e-r-t-s town uh, edward as in oh edward, edward. Edwardstown, yeah. It's a weird I was looking it up at one point, and I'm sorry. So it's Edwardstown. Edwardstown. That's okay, fine. that's the name of the town. And so you have proof that that tunnel system exists, correct? Yes. yes. And you have that in your on your YouTube channel, which we'll also share, and the video that you just mentioned will also share in the description of this video. Thank you. Thank and then we'll put some stuff in between also, so there's some images to support me you because know, your record keeping is impeccable and uh it's interesting um probably indeed the hubris um that you have so many records and that nothing has come of it so far yes and yet uh so that yes so if, if you think that maybe they're uh, laughing at you or whatever uh, possible still and then at the same time it can't all be laughter because <laughs> things are changing also. <laughs> I have multiple med medical reports to back up the abuse that I suffered as well. And so, that as well. Everything. you got records of everything. So thank you so much for sharing here with me and for being patient with my interrupting you with many questions. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure, Annika. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you for the opportunity. It's my pleasure too.